Anyway, I wanted to uh, just share a little bit of my testimony because uh, most of you don't know me, but uh, even though my dad was a Southern Baptist pastor, I did not know the Lord. And growing up in the 60s here in the United States, in fact, my sister and I were the only two of color in our elementary school, Forest Grove Elementary School in Montgomery County, Maryland. And how many know kids are going to let you know how different you are at that age? You know, they don't have the kind of uh, mannerisms that, unfortunately, most adults, a lot of adults don't have it either. But there was a lot of racism. There was a lot of racism. And uh, they called me everything from chink, even though I'm not Chinese, to Jap, even though I'm not Japanese. By the way, as an Asian, as a Korean, we can tell the difference between the Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Can I give you some cross-cultural tips to sensitize you to know the discernment and how to tell the difference. It's very, very simple. If you see a rich-looking Asian, they're Chinese. And that's not even a joke because now China has surpassed the United States in GDP. If you see a smart-looking Asian, they're Japanese. They'll take whatever we invent and make it better. <laughs> but if you see a handsome-looking Asian, they're Korean, so that's how you tell the difference between Korean, Chinese, and Japanese. Not joking. Well, you know, growing up in an all-white school, I grew up very insecure. I wanted to be accepted by my peers, and, um, and uh, I got in a lot of fights. And, and so, but what happened was is that the Beatles came, of course, in 63, and the whole um, summer of love in 67, and the hippie revolution began, and somehow I identified myself with that group. I wanted to be... I wanted to be a long-haired hippie, so I refused to cut my hair. And my, my dad just was on my case. I didn't cut my hair for three and a half years. And um, I started to do hard drugs when I was 15. I'm talking about cocaine, heroin, LSD. By the time I was 17, I was a drug addict. And I became a high school dropout. Now, I want you to know, as an Asian, the most unpardonable sin is to drop out of school. <laughs> The whole objective to come to the United States is to go to school, and for me to be a high school dropout was just unbelievable. I was thrown in jail when I was 15, and, um, and I just started to hitchhike around the country. I rejected Christianity. I got into Eastern religion, got into Zen Buddhism. I was lost. And, uh, but my parents, thank God for praying parents, amen? And uh, my grandparents were praying for me, and in fact, my grandmother just went home to be with the Lord last year at the age of 101. And um, yeah, she prayed me in. And, um, and I say, if your grandmother's praying for you, you don't have a chance. You will get saved. <laughs> but she, she prayed, and my parents prayed for me. And to make a long story short, I want to encourage you, if you get a chance to get, pick, up, pick up my book, Spirit-Led Evangelism, I share the testimony in detail. But I had an encounter with the Lord in 1973. Uh, it was in May 1973, and I knew, I, by revelation, I knew that Jesus is indeed the way, the truth, and the life. But I didn't want to give up my drugs. I didn't want to give up my lifestyle, my parting lifestyle. And, and no one led me to the Lord. I just had an encounter uh, when I was, I was doing my Zen chant. And I, I was so tired of the Zen chant, I said, this, this sucks. <laughs> you know, I've been doing this for one year. I've been doing this for one year. I've got nothing out of it. And so I said, God, I don't even know if you exist. But if you do exist, reveal yourself. I want to know the truth. And he revealed himself to me in the person of Jesus Christ. And I could not stop weeping for the next three days. Just the love of God just came upon me on and off throughout the day. I would break down and weep. But no one led me to the Lord and no one was discipling me. And I didn't know anything about giving up drugs and, and to live purely before the Lord. And, and so... So anyway, two weeks later, I'm at a Deep Purple concert. Now, some of you baby boomers know what I'm talking about, okay? How many of you have heard of Deep Purple? Back in 1973, they were the top band with the number one song, Smoke on the Water, okay? And I know some of you young kids are saying, Deep Purple who? What are you talking about? <laughs> so, but anyway, they were a heavy metal rock and roll band from England, and uh, they were playing at the Baltimore Civic Center. And we had the best seat in the house. I was right in the center of the Civic Center, third row from the stage. And during the intermission, I'm having this debate with God. I'm saying, God, can I follow you and still smoke pot? I won't sell drugs, but I, you know. <laughs> Seriously, that's what. So I was trying to make a deal with God because I wanted to be a Christian and still party. 
And all of a sudden, two guys I never saw before in my life came right up to me. They sat down next to me. I thought they were crashing the concert because my friends were walking around during the intermission and they were my friend's seat. So I leaned over to tell them these seats are taken. But before I could get a word out, the guy who sat next to me said, I know what you're thinking. You think that you're right with God now, but you're not. And if you're really serious about following him, you have to obey him. And with those words, they got up and they walked out of the auditorium. And to this day, I don't know who they were. I don't know if they were angels. I don't know if they were two radical Christians who were giving me a word of knowledge. I have no idea, but it's just rocked me. And I said to God, God, what do you want me to do? And I heard the voice of God for the first time. I heard him say, throw away your drugs, leave this concert, and follow me. How do you know that has to be God? That's not the devil telling you to do that. I had snuck a water pipe in to the concert hall, threw it down, I threw my quaaludes, I threw down my, uh, my, a pound of marijuana I had brought into the concert, and um, immediately someone picked it up, you know, they were just, you know. <laughs> then uh, the concert started, Smoke on the Water was the first song, smoke was pouring out, lights were flashing, people ran up to the front. How I many know we're not talking about a uh, Michael Smith concert here, we're talking about a heavy metal rock concert and people were up and I was trapped and the first thought that came to my mind is I can't leave I'm stuck but the Lord said leave this concert so I had to intentionally fight my way through the crowd 15,000 people walk out of the Civic Center and the moment I walked out I was instantly delivered from drug addiction and uh, I've never done drugs since never done drugs since that was May 29th 1973 and it's been the most amazing 42 years. I am so blessed. I'm a blessed person. I'm married for 36 years, four adult children, two of them pastors, and uh, I have four grandchildren. And it's just been amazing what God has done. And God loves you, and He too wants to bring about just the deliverance from the dominion of darkness. And darkness is relative, it could be personal addictions, could be bondages, bad habits, sin and deliver you into his marvelous light in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Can we thank God for his grace and mercy in our lives? God is so good. So, so that's a little bit of my background, and, um, but I'm going to share in my message how the Lord impacted me again in Toronto in 1994. But I want you to turn with me to Malachi chapter 4, 5 and 6. Of course, Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, so you could just go to the New Testament, turn the page to Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, hearts of the children to their fathers. This I come and strike their earth with a curse. I know that we could take a lot of different angles on this passage, and there's been so many messages preached on this. But I just want to talk about revival and the Elijah Revolution. And I'm quoting from my dear friend Lou Engel, who wrote a book called The Elijah Revolution, and I highly recommend that book. I feel this passage is relevant for today. I believe that we're in the midst of another wave of revival, and I believe that this could be the beginning of the revival with a capital R. And, um, and I know we've heard, you know, we've been talking about revival, and frankly, I believe we've been in revival, but it's like revival's here, but how many know there's always more? Amen? We just had Lauren Cunningham, uh, the founder of Youth with a Mission at our church last year, and he shared a vision that he had in January of 2014. So now he's speaking July of 2014. So he shared a vision he had um, earlier that year. And I wish I had time to unpack it because the way he explained it was just absolutely stunning. But he had an open vision where he saw a 70-foot tsunami wave hitting America. And he asked the Lord, what is this? And the Lord spoke to him that this is going to be the greatest revival, the greatest harvest ever in the history of United States Church. It's going to come upon the United States. 
But do you believe that? If you do believe it, give him a hand. Just thank the Lord for that by faith. Now, when Lauren Cunningham, you know, and Lauren Cunningham, uh, he's on that uh, 40 top 40 leaders. And, you know, he began his ministry when he was 21 years old. Um, and so for young people, I want to encourage you, God can use you at 21 or even younger. Um, and, um, but he's only had three open visions. This is his only third open vision in 60 years. So we're not just talking about, you know, he's seeing things all the time. And so it was a very significant one. And then I was just at a conference in Alabama, and, um, and I was with James Gall, and James Gall saw my eye watch, which my family gave me on Father's Day. And, um, and he said, you know, this is a very prophetic, significant watch. I said, why? And he reminded me of a prophetic word that a prophet named Bob Jones gave in 1983. And I want to try to be as accurate as possible because James is sharing with me. I didn't hear Bob Jones give the word, but James is sharing with me and uh, just reporting what Bob Jones said because he was there when Bob Jones spoke in 1983 in Kansas City. And Bob Jones said, there will be three signs before the great revival hits America. Number one, there will be a morning after pill invented, an abortion pill, which of course has now been invented and unfortunately you could buy one at Walmart. Number two, he said, when America legalizes same-sex marriage and begins to push it, that will be the second sign. Now, this is 1983, and we thought, he's crazy. When will America do that? And the third sign will be that there will be a watch invented that the Chinese and the rice paddies of China will be watching worship music on their watch. And today, through YouTube and, you know, um, iTunes and etc., with this watch, you can do that. I mean, it's just amazing that technology has how it's developed, and of course, Apple is the number one selling phone in mainland China. And so when he said that, I said, oh my goodness, well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of shaking going on, but yet in the midst of it, the sign, three signs that the, the greatest revival in the history of the church is imminent, that brought so much encouragement to my heart and should bring encouragement to yours as well. 